Uh, yeah, first of all, let me say how pleased I am to be in the show. And I think it's a, it's quite a, it's a different kind of show for Oregon because it, this, this show is emphasizing so much more of what goes on in downstate and not, not just Portland, which we're kind of used to. And uh, even in the big Oregon annuals, they've been, uh, for one reason or another, really emphasizing uh, Portland. I think it's just a, a great pleasure to see so many people, so many artists who I, whose work I wasn't really aware of. Is this loud enough? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, that being said, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, about self-portraits. And uh, I've been doing them for uh, for a lot of years. The first one that I have, uh, that I kept is, uh, I did about, age about 11. So for about, uh, since, since that drawing, which I worked on for a couple of hours, peering in a mirror and, uh, and observing, and I think uh, I'm really kind of impressed with what I was getting out of, what I was looking at. I was looking out at the world and not just at myself, but uh, sort of really investigating who is that person in the mirror, which is, which is, um, and I've, since that time I've done lots and lots of, of um, self-portraits. So even if I've done a couple a year, I've probably done 80 self-portraits. Uh, not all paintings, but lots of drawings and so on. Um, this isn't all just ego. This is uh, the artist looks in the in the mirror and sees a kind of uh, somewhat alien person, as we I think a lot of us do. You 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 sort of say at least sometimes in your life. I'm sure whether you're an artist or not, you say, "Who is that person? Who is that really?" Um, I was going to Google where you can find out lots of and lots of stuff. And uh, I asked Google how many portraits, how many self-portraits Van Gogh had done. And uh, it said, it's probably right, is that in the last three years of his life, which is his most productive time, he did 30 paintings of himself. That's, that's a, a lot, because uh, these aren't just slap, slap dash. Um, and uh, then I asked uh, Google, what about Rembrandt? How many did he do? And it said that there were uh, over 100. Uh, probably 40 of those are paintings. And then, of course, many etchings and uh, drawings. Uh, one of my favorite artists is uh, Max Beckman, who also did myriad self-portraits. and. Um, could you hold that a second? Oh, <laughs> this is my log. <laughs> I ran across this, which I, which I wrote down. Oh, thank you. No, I'll hold OK. Um, and the, uh, Beckman said, uh, we don't know, meaning we, the scientific community of the world, we don't know what the self is. The self is the great veiled mystery of the world. I think that's great. And uh, uh, as I say, one of the reasons that, that artists do self-portraits is this kind of investigation of, of who's this funny guy in the mirror. Uh, let me say uh, some things directly about this painting. Um, it's a diptych, so there are two paintings joined together. And uh, it started out with the idea of this drawing of Louis Bunce, who was uh, one of my mentors at the uh, Museum Art School. Um, and this is, a, uh, uh, this is a drawing in pencil on canvas. 
And that was the first thing I did in this painting. And it, the rest of the painting changed quite a bit over working on it. Uh, but that, that uh, stayed just as it is. It's a, it's a pencil drawing which has been fixed, so it's, it's part, of the, uh, part of the painting, the rest of which is uh, acrylic and oil. Uh, the right-hand side of the painting at one point wasn't working at all and I abandoned it for a year or so, the whole painting, and put it away, and then I pulled it out and I thought, well, the idea, I, I still like the idea of this big vacant space and then the, the self-portrait on one side. Uh, so what I did was just, just throw that canvas away and started that image a second time and kept working on this side. Uh, one of the things for me about painting is that very that you I paint in order to learn something, and and very often the painting becomes a real struggle somewhere in there. Uh, and once they come out well, it's sort of a wonderful uh, result of the struggle. But it's sort of like Jacob wrestling with the angel. And he wrestles and wrestles and wrestles, and then in the morning he says, who are you? I mean, he still doesn't know. He's probably been wrestling with himself. But this is, uh, this is what a lot of artists do, and which is my method of work anyway, is that because then something happens in the struggle that, that gives me something. Uh, the, 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 uh, the artist is standing drawing, and this, uh, the drawing is, is of my granddaughter. Uh, it's a kind of silhouette. Uh, the, uh, and the, on the right hand side are, it's as if it's in the studio and these might be paintings on the wall, but they change quite a bit during the, during the painting of it. One, the nude represents uh, lots and lots of life drawing that I've done, and the nude in general to me is kind of like a symbol for art itself. Uh, there's a landscape and there was lightning coming down. Uh, there's uh, the, I do a lot of, a lot of uh, city, sort of imaginative cityscapes. Um, the, there's a silhouette in there, which again is kind of a repeat of myself but simplified and looking like some kind of bird. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner is, um, is a rendition of rowers, uh, and I, rowed, I, I did rowing for about 30 years, uh, and uh, that became a, a big subject matter of mine. So, a um, couple of other things I might point out is about the, the, uh, the painting is that the idea was to keep this area really open, but I also wanted it to be spatial. So just things like, uh, just adding this, this dimension here as if it was a shadow moving in, I think begins to make that seem like it's an, an inward space. And something like this, adding a shadow to the edge of, of this form coming in, turns that into some kind of uh, uh, painting, which is sitting on a floor rather than just floating. Um, the head, uh, the head, I, and particularly the head, I worked on a lot, and it changed quite a bit. Um, in general, the features are made up of a couple of triangles. One is the nose and the other is the triangle that starts from the cheekbone and, and comes in to the crease above the, the, must, uh, the mustache. And then the other is a kind of C-shape of the mustache. So it's very much simplified in, in terms of what I'm giving you about the form. And if you look closely, you you'll see that there are no eyes rendered in it. So that the, the eyes are implied, and you, I think when looking at the face, you don't miss them. You feel that there, that, that there are eyes in there looking at you, but you're not actually seeing.
seeing the rendering of it. Anyway. So um, there's more that I could say about the composition and so on, but let me see if there are any questions. I'm like silhouette of your granddaughter. I'm just curious as to, you know, do you draw these, do you just draw by hand and correct until you get it right, or do you measure, or how do you get the proportions right when you're drawing either the fa your, your face or your granddaughter's face? So uh, it's drawn several times, and the first rendition of this was, uh, was not exactly like that, it, and nor was I thinking about the, my granddaughter at, the, at that point. And then I redrew it a couple of times, and if you look at the line, it's actually worked quite a bit. There's a, it changes color and it changes dimension. So it's it's not. I want it to look kind of free, but it's not actually. It's worked uh, until I get it to just the right, the right um, quality of line that I want. And then it then it began to seem like her. So then I I got a photograph of her. Uh, from the side, and I also I made some drawings from the side, so I, I made it look more like her, and it's not, again, not that specific. If you had six girls and you said, which one is this, you might not guess it exactly. Incidentally, out of all of, all of this, <coughs> the painting in this, this was the most fun to do, <laughs> the apron. And then, the, then the, the trick there was to leave it, <laughs> you know, leave it long. It, that was fun, but, and it worked, so he, and it, it also is kind of suggestive, I think, of mental activity or something like that. I, I love things that have kind of a double meaning. Uh, yeah, I love it as an emotional color. I think it's just, just terrific. Uh, this is a very deep red, and uh, it's not cadmium light at all. But it's also, uh, and it's hard to work with cadmium red D and give it any life, I think. What I've done is, is this is uh, sandpapered back into it, and then if you look at it closely, there. There's uh, ink, there's a oil stick that's been scrubbed into it and wiped off and painted over. So there's a lot going on in the, in the surface. And at times it was, uh, it was brighter, and, but I kept knocking it back because I wanted that, that very deep rose red. But you said you used both acrylic and oil, did you? start with acrylic and then put oil on top of that or are some portions of the work just acrylic and others oil uh yeah generally i start with acrylic and then move into oil but i over the the years now i've gotten so i i work back and forth and so it really is mixed media and, and i will paint acrylic back onto oil which you're not supposed to do and scrub it in and scrape it and so on and if it doesn't come off it's compatible i mean there's a, there's a compatible color and i want to make sure it doesn't peel off or anything that's important to me that, that a painting should have some kind of uh, uh, permanence as permanent as i can make it but i do unorthodox things the only thing i can say in that defense is that i talked to a couple of curators about it and they uh, i mean not curators of uh, restorers and they assured me that that was okay to do i do label the back of the, the painting acrylic and oil so that if in the future someone's working on it they know what they're dealing with i think i should wind up now so. I'll be around, what you want? I was going to ask when you said that, that you, you paint to learn something. And when you're doing the self-portrait, I'm curious, like, how does that differ? Because the time as compared to, to taking a selfie, that's very instantaneous. Yeah. We look back at that, and we have a certain sensation when we see our face. Um, how does that compare, or does it at all, with looking back when you see your face in a painting? 
That's a, that's a very interesting question because I think that what I'm aiming at in the painting is not, not something where you would say, even looking at another uh, self-portrait of mine that I did two years ago and say, well, this is definitely older. I mean, I'm not interested. I think with some people like Rembrandt, you can kind of do that because he was, he was interested in a verisimilitude that was, he wanted something very specific. I'm not interested in that. I'm more interested in the structure of the form and in, I'm often seeing something accidentally in a mirror or in a, often, often it's in a, you know, you get used to your mirror at home, but if I see a mirror in a restroom, in a restaurant or something, the light's different and I suddenly see myself differently. And I, I often take my camera out and take pictures. Uh, one of the, I'll just, one other little anecdote about that is that I do use the, the cell phone for, for pictures a lot. And uh, then I put them on my computer and, and, and work from them, a lot of them. But what, what really is bothersome is when I push the, the, the button on the camera and it turns it around so I'm facing myself. <laughs> it scares me. <laughs> My face isn't prepared. I'm not. And, and this is this is a prepared face. That's the difference.